Forward of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. Forward. This book is intended to accomplish three distinct purposes. First, to arouse a greater interest in oral reading. Second, to develop an expressive voice, sadly lacking in the case of most Americans. And third, to give freedom and grace in the bodily attitudes and movements which are involved in reading and speaking. The stories given are for the most part adaptations of favorite tales from folklore, Anderson, Grimm, Aesop, and the Arabian Nights having been freely drawn upon. Children are dramatic by nature. They are for the time of kings, the fairies, and the heroes that they picture in their imaginations. They are these characters with such abandon and with such intense pleasure that the onlooker must believe that nature intended that they should give play to this dramatic instinct, not so much formally, with all the trappings of the man-made stage, but spontaneously and naturally, as they talk and read. If this expressive instinct can be utilized in the teaching of reading, we shall be able both to add greatly to the child's enjoyment and to improve the quality of his oral reading. In these days, when so many books are hastily read in school, there is a tendency to sacrifice expression to the mechanics and interpretation of reading. Those acquainted with school work know too well the resulting monotonous, indistinct speech and the self-conscious, listless attitude which characterize so much of the reading of pupils in grades above the third. It is believed that this little book will aid in overcoming these serious faults in reading, which all teachers and parents deplore. The dramatic appeal of the stories will cause the child to lose himself in the character he is impersonating, and read with a naturalness and expressiveness unknown to him before and this improvement will be evident in all his oral reading and even in his speech. The use of the book permits the whole range of expression, from merely reading the stories effectively to acting them out with as little or as much stage setting or costuming as a parent or teacher may desire. The stories are especially designed to be read as a part of the regular reading work. Many different plans for using the book will suggest themselves to the teacher. After a preliminary reading of a story during the study period, the teacher may assign different parts to various children, she herself reading the stage directions and the other brief descriptions enclosed in brackets. The italicized explanations in parentheses are not intended to be read aloud. They will aid in giving the child the cue as to the way the part should be rendered. After the story has been read in this way, if thought advisable, it can be played informally and simply, with no attempt at costuming or theatric effects. It will often add to the interest of the play to have some of the children represent certain of the inanimate objects of the scene, as the forest, the town gate, a door, etc. Occasionally, for the open day, or as a special exercise, a favorite play may be given by the children with the simplest kind of costuming and stage setting. These can well be made in the school as part of the manual training and sewing work. In giving the play, it will generally be better not to have pupils memorize the exact words of the book, but to depend upon the impromptu rendering of their parts. This method will contribute more largely to the training in English. The best results will usually be obtained by using these stories in the fourth grade. In some schools, however, the stories in the first part of the book may profitably be used in the third grade. The author has been led to believe from her own experience and from her conversation with many other teachers that there is a pronounced call for this kind of book. She therefore hopes that in the preparation of this book she may have been of service to the teachers and children who may be led to use it. A. S. End of Forward Play one of children's classics in dramatic form. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Travelers and the Hatchet. Narrator, Stage Directions. Ellen Preckle. First Traveler, read by Shakira Searle. Second Traveler, read by On Lang. The Carpenter, read by Todd. Time, last week. Place, a high road. The two travelers journey along the road. A hatchet lies in the dust at one side. Seeing the hatchet, taking it up. Ah, see what I have found. Do not say I, but rather, what we have found. Nonsense. Did I not see the hatchet first? And did I not take it up? Well, then, claim the hatchet, since that is plainly your wish. Enter the carpenter. To first traveler. Aha! Thief! Now I have caught you. He seizes the first traveler. No thief am I, sir. But my own hatchet is in your hand, sir. Come along to the judge, sir. To second traveler. Alas! We are undone. Do not say we. You are undone. Not I. You would not allow me to share the prize. You cannot expect me to share the danger. I bid you good day, sir. End of The Travelers and the Hatchet Play 2 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, Stage Directions, Ellen Preckle the Man, read by Todd. Wife, read by Rebecca Braunert Plunkett. Their Son, Little Hand, read by On Lamb. Grandfather, read by Larry Wilson. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Old Man and His Grandson. Time, now. Place, a certain man's house. The man, his wife, little Hans, and the grandfather sit at the table eating the noon meal. Be careful, father. You are spilling the soup on your coat. Grandfather, trying to steady his trembling hand. Yes, yes. I'll be careful. Short pause. Grandfather, you have spilled the soup on my clean tablecloth. Uh, dear me, uh, dear me. Here, father, is your plate of meat. The old man takes the plate but lets it fall. There now. Just say what you've done. My hand shook so. I I'm sorry. So sorry. That won't mend the plate. Nor buy a new one. He should eat from wooden dishes. Let him have that one for his meat. The grandfather sighs sadly. The wife gets a wooden dish and fills it with meat. Little Hans leaves the table and plays with his blocks on the floor, handing the wooden dish to the grandfather. Here's one you can't break. Go now and sit in the corner behind the oven. You shall eat there hereafter. I cannot have my tablecloth soiled. That I cannot. The grandfather takes his wooden plate and goes to the seat in the corner behind the oven. His eyes are filled with tears. Come, little hands, and finish your dinner. Bless me. What are you making, child? A wooden trough for you and father to eat out of when I grow big. The man and his wife look at each other. There is a pause. He will treat us as we have treated father. It will serve us right. Father, throw that wooden dish out of the window. I am ashamed of what I have done. Forgive me. Father, come back to the table. I too am ashamed. Forgive me, dear father. End of The Old Man and His Grandson Play three of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Crow and the Fox. Narrator, Stage Directions. Ellen Preckle. Madam Crow, read by Rebecca Braunert Plunkett. Miss Crow, read by Lydia. Master Fox, read by Shakira Soul. Time, yesterday noon. 
place a high tree in a grove madam crow sits in the tree enter miss crow she carries a large piece of cheese in her mouth oh joy oh joy come dear daughter come we'll dine as if we were queen and princess miss crow flies to madam crow enter master fox i bid you good morning dear madam good morning to you dear sir with your permission i'll speak with your daughter she'll be pleased to listen that she will you are so clever nay madam not so clever only thoughtful he sighs deeply twice you have something on your mind <sighs> yes dear madam i am thinking of your daughter then speak speak now sir at once sir i speak oh sweet miss crow how beautiful your wings are do you hear that daughter miss crow nods spreading her wings proudly i speak again how bright your eye dear maid how graceful your neck bend your neck child now bend it well that he may better see your grace miss crow bends neck twice but oh that such a sweet bird should be dumb should be so utterly dumb he weeps gently in his little pocket handkerchief do you think sir she cannot caw as well as the rest of us i must think so dear madam alas weeping again in his little pocket handkerchief you shall think so then no longer caw child caw as you've never caught before opening mouth dropping cheese caw, caw. fox quickly snaps up the cheese thank you miss crow remember dear madam that whatever i said of her beauty i said nothing of her brains he goes waving the crows a farewell with his little pocket handkerchief end of the crow and the fox play four of children's classics in dramatic form this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org children's classics in dramatic form by augusta stevenson the miller his son and their donkey narrator stage directions ellen preckel the miller read by on lamb his son read by todd first maid read by rebecca braunard plunkett second maid read by lydia third maid read by margaret espayat first old man read by shakira Searle. second old man read by larry wilson the old man read by wade campbell first goody read by lydia second goody read by margaret espayat third goody read by rebecca braunard plunkett the mayor read by wade campbell first clerk read by margaret espayat second clerk read by larry wilson time this morning place a bridge near a town and not far from a fair the miller and his son are driving their donkey across the bridge they go to the fair do you expect to get a good price for our donkey father ay lad the fair is the place to take your wares our donkey is not young though neither is he so old though but he is not so fat though neither is he so lean though truly he might be worse better or worse he must be sold three maids enter the bridge they go to the fair look there did you ever see such geese as i live walking when they might ride you'll get a laugh at the fair old man the maids pass on this may be true yet you upon the beast lad the boy mounts the donkey enter three old men they talk together earnestly they go to the fair look you there that proves what i was saying ay uh, there's no respect showing old age in these days ay there's that young rogue riding while his old father has to walk the old men pass on get down lad twould indeed look better should i ride the lad dismounts the miller mounts enter three goodies they go to the fair look goodies look did you ever see anything so cruel you lazy old fellow how can you ride while your own child walks in the dust you poor poor child the goodies pass on shaking their heads and their canes indignantly come lad get up behind me why father 
I'm not tired. I know, but we must try to please them. Come. The lad mounts, sitting behind his father. Enter the mayor and his clerks. They go to the fair. <laughs> Look, will you? He turns to the miller. Pray, honest friend, is that beast your own? Yes, my lord mayor. <laughs> One would not think so from the way you load him. Say you not so, my clerks. Just so, my lord mayor. Even so, my lord mayor. Why, you two fellows are better able to carry the poor donkey than he you. Say you not so, my clerks. Just so, my lord mayor. Even so, my lord mayor. Come, my son, to please them, will carry the donkey. They dismount and try to lift the donkey. This frightens the poor beast. He tries to get away and falls over the bridge into the deep river. I have tried to please everyone. I have pleased no one. And we have lost our donkey in the bargain. End of The Miller, His Son, and Their Donkey Play 5 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, Stage Directions by Ellen Preckel. Straw, read by Larry Wilson. The Coal, read by Tricia G. The Snowflake, read by Rebecca Bronard Plunkett. Sugarloaf, read by Hallie Kill. Sausage, read by Lydia. Dog, read by Hugh Gillis. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. Each in His Own Place. Time, yesterday. Place, in a tiny house. The tiny kitchen is seen. The sausage is stirring the pot. The coal is tending the fire. The sugar loaf is laying the table. Enter straw with a load of wood, throwing wood down. Think you'll need more wood for dinner, sausage? Sausage does not answer. She gets into the pot to flavor the vegetables. Sausage is quite put out. What's the trouble? No one knows. Enter Snowflake with a pail of water. Where's Sausage? She is flavoring the vegetables. Sausage comes out of the pot. Here's the water, Sausage. Sausage does not answer. Will you come for the water, Sausage? No, madam, I will not. Sausage? I've been slave here long enough. Sister Sausage? I mean just what I say. Have I not done my share of the work? Have I not done my share? Have I not done my share? And have I not done my share? Please to tell me what you do. I bring in wood that coal may make the fire. I make the fire that the pot may boil. I draw the water and bring it from the brook. I lay the table nicely. What do I? Eh? What do I? I must stand over the fire. I must not only stir the dinner, I must flavor it with myself. For each of you there is one duty. For me there are plainly three. But sister... Don't sister me! Sausage, dear, would you break up our pretty home? And we all so happy here. There must be a change. There must be a change. Someone else can stand over the fire, can stir the pot, can flavor the vegetables. If I flavored them, they could not be eaten. That's what you're always saying, but I'm not so sure of it. If I stirred the pot, it would be the end of me. Yes, you say that often enough, but I'm not so sure that is true. Should I stand over the fire? I'd be no more. Excuses, excuses. It's plain that I should not get into the pot. And why not, miss? Why not? Would be goodbye for me if I should. Excuses, excuses! I say there must be a change. Tis I who will bring the wood or draw the water. But, Sausage, you should stay within. Not I, sir. I'll out of the pot and out of the house, I will. I'll see a bit of the world, I will. Well, if she will, she will getting slips come now and draw for it she holds the slips for the others to draw drawing reading from slip who gets this must make the fire drawing reading from slip who gets this must draw the water drawing reading from slip who gets this must stir the pot and flavor it with herself drawing reading from slip who gets this must lay the table nicely reading from last slip who gets this must bring the wood well that pleases me. Straw, see if the fire needs wood. Straw hesitates. Come, come, do your duty. Straw crosses the hearth and looks into the fire. He is very careful, but the fire reaches him, and he is gone in a puff. Poor Straw. Well, 
tis my duty to stir the pot and flavor it with myself she crosses to the hearth but just as she reaches it she disappears without so much as a cry poor snowflake well tis my duty to draw the water she forgets that the pail is full falls into it and is seen no more poor sugar loaf well tis my duty to lay the table nicely he forgets that he is still burning from having lately tended the fire as he places the plates the tablecloth catches fire and wraps itself around him from inside the burning cloth this is the end of me weeping oh dear me dear me who would have thought to turn out so badly well tis my duty to bring in wood she opens the door and is face to face with a hungry dog who's sniffing about ah i thought you'd be coming out soon do you want to see me sir why yes i've been waiting for you how good to be out in the world they always said my place was within they did eh well just to please them i'll put you there he swallows her quickly which ends both sister sausage and our story play six of children's classics in dramatic form this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org narrator stage directions by ellen preckle good man read by larry wilson his wife read by tricia g the first peasant read by rebecca brawnard plunkett second peasant read by hallie kill third peasant read by lydia Tollkeeper, read by Hugh Gillis. Hostler, read by Margaret Espayat. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. What the Goodman Does is Always Right. Scene 1. Time, early one morning. Place, a very old farmhouse. The Goodman and his wife are seated in their spare room because it is fair day. Yes, I think it would be as well to sell our horse. Or, as you say, we might exchange him for something more useful. What shall we exchange him for? You know best, good man. Whatever you do will be right. Starting out. It is fair day. I will ride into town and see what can be done. Wait till I fasten your neckerchief. You shall have a pretty double bow this time, for you are going to the fair. She ties the neckerchief. The goodman starts out. Wait till I have smoothed your hat. She smooths his old hat. Now you are ready. Going be at the window wife nodding yes surely and i will wave at you as you ride by scene two time two hours later place near the toll gate on the road to the fair the goodman is seen riding his horse enter from a country lane a peasant driving a cow stopping calling hello there you with the cow stopping yes good man your cow gives good milk i am certain nodding none richer in this country a horse is of more value than a cow, but I don't care for that. A cow will be more useful to me, so if you like, we'll exchange. To be sure I will. Here's your cow. Here is your horse. The peasant goes off riding the horse. A second peasant, driving a sheep, enters from a field nearby, sees him and calls. Hello there, you with the sheep. Stopping. Yes, good man. I should like to have that sheep. She is a good fat sheep. There is plenty of grass for her by our fence at home, and in the winter we could keep her in the room with us. Do you wish to buy her? Will you not take my cow in exchange? I am willing. Here is your sheep. Here is your cow. The second peasant goes off driving the cow. Enter from a farmyard nearby a third peasant carrying a goose. What a heavy creature you have there. Stopping. She has plenty of feathers and plenty of fat. She would look well paddling in the water at our place. Stopping. She would look well in any place. She would be very useful to my wife. She could make all sorts of profit out of her. Indeed she could, Goodman. How often she has said, if now we only had a goose. Well, this goose is for sale. I will give my sheep for your goose, and thanks into the bargain. I'm winning. Here's your goose. Here is your sheep. The peasant goes off with the sheep. The goodman discovers a hen in the tollkeeper's potato field, calling. Ah, that's the finest fowl I ever saw, tollkeeper. You're right about that, good man. She's finer than our pastor's brood hen. Upon my word, she is. I should like to have that fowl. She is for sale. I think it would be a good exchange if I could get her for my goose. Well, it wouldn't be a bad thing. Then here is your goose. Here is your fowl. Enter a hostler carrying a sack. 
to Hostler. What have you in that sack, friend? Rotten apples to feed the pigs with. Why, that will be a terrible waste. Uh, I should like to take them home to my wife. Astonished. To your wife? Nodding. You see, last year our old apple tree bore only one apple, which we kept in the cupboard till it was quite rotten. It was always property, my wife said. What will you give me for the sackful? Your wife would then have a great deal of property. Well, I will give you my fowl in exchange. Here is your sack of rotten apples. Here is your fowl. The hostler goes with the fowl. Toll, good man. I will not go to the fair today. I have done a great deal of business, and I am tired. I will go back home. Scene 3 Time, two hours later. Place, the old farmhouse. Enter the good man carrying the sack. The wife waits for him in the spare room because he has been away. Well, wife, I've made the exchange. Ah, well, you always understand what you are about. I got a cow in exchange for the horse. Good. Now we shall have plenty of milk and butter and cheese on the table. That was a fine exchange. Yes, but I changed the cow for a sheep. Ah, better still. We have just enough grass for a sheep. Use milk and cheese. Woolen jackets and stockings. The cow could not give all those. How you think of everything. But I changed the sheep for a goose. Then we shall have roast goose to eat this year. You, dear good man, are always thinking of something to please me. But I gave away the goose for a fowl. A fowl? Well, that was a good exchange. The fowl will lay eggs and hatch them. We shall soon have a poultry yard. Ah, this is just what I was wishing for. Yes, but I exchanged the fowl for a sack of rotten apples. My dear good husband, now I'll tell you something. Do you know, almost as soon as you left me this morning, I began thinking of what I could give you nice for supper. I thought of bacon with eggs and sweet herbs. But we have no sweet herbs. For that reason, I went over to our neighbors and begged her to lend me a handful. That was right. They have plenty. So I thought, but she said, Lend? I have nothing to lend, not even a rotten apple. Now I can lend her ten or the whole sackful. It makes me laugh to think of it. I am so glad. So you think what I did was right? What the good man does is always right. End of What the Goodman Does is Always Right. Play 7 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, Stage Directions by Ellen Preckle. Mother Mouse, read by Margaret Espayat. Miss Mouse, read by Tricia G. The Cat, read by Rebecca Braunert Plunkett. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Cat and the Mouse. Time, perhaps this minute. Place, perhaps in your own garret. Mother Mouse and Miss Mouse are in their spare room because Mother Mouse is getting ready for a journey. Miss Mouse helps her. The Cat is outside, peeping now and then through the window, but so slyly that the mice do not see her. Now mind you keep one eye on our grease-pot, child. That I will, dear mother. Let no one in. No one. No one. No one, dear mother. I'll not be long away. Good-bye, my child. Starting out, stopping. Mind you show no one the grease-pot, child. No one. No one. No one, dear mother. Mother Mouse goes out of the front door, calling through window. Oh, Miss Mouse, oh, Miss Mouse. Who calls? Only I. Will you please let me in? Shaking head. Mother said. Interrupting quickly. This a matter of business. Shaking head. But Mother said. Interrupting. This most important. But Mother said. Interrupting. I wish your advice. You're so clever showing she is pleased, starting to window. Oh, do you truly think so? Nodding. Everyone thinks so. Showing she is more pleased, going to the window. Oh, do they truly? Oh, truly they do. Showing she is most pleased, opening window. What else nice say they? Jumping in. 
That I'll tell you by and by, sniffing about. There must be a grease pot around. Am I not right? Mother said, interrupting, only tell me if I be right. Twill do no harm, hesitating. Well, then, yes, but tis put away for our winter stores, nodding. Just so. Now I can't decide where to keep my grease pot when I have bought one. Won't you give me your advice? You are so wise. Do you truly think I'm wise? Nodding. Aye, and if you will tell me where to keep my grease pot when I have bought it, I'll tell you something more. About me? Nodding. Yes. What everyone says about your being so beautiful. But first, I must know where to keep my grease pot. Then listen, you must keep it when you have bought it in the northwest corner. The cat runs quickly to the northwest corner. Come away, come away. Why, here is your grease pot. Come away, I say. Looking into the pot. Truly, the fat is kept hard and cool here. I pray you, come away. Mother does not so much as let me look into it. Tis not yet time, she says. Looking again into pot. Exactly. She leaves the pot and joins Miss Mouse. Tis just what I'll tell my kittens about my grease pot when I have bought it. Ah, then you have kittens at home? Nodding. Such beautiful kittens. The eldest is white with brown marks. He must be charming. I've a mind to tell you his name. First, though, run out to see if your dear mother is not coming. Miss Mouse nods and runs out. The cat quickly creeps to the grease pot and licks the top off. She crosses to the window just as Miss Mouse returns. Mother is nowhere to be seen. Now what did you name your eldest child? Top off. Top off? Why, that is a curious name. Is it common in your family? Oh, no. My second child has a wide ring around his neck. Remarkable. Very. What did you name him? I gave him an unusual name. I will tell you what it is. First, though, run out to see if your dear mother is coming. Miss Mouse nods and runs out. The cat creeps to the grease pot and eats half the fat, then crosses to the window. Miss Mouse returns. Mother is nowhere to be seen. Now, what did you name your second child? Half out. Half out? I never heard such a name. Tis not in the calendar, I'm sure. What does that matter if it pleases me? Now the last child is really a wonder. He is quite black and has little white claws, but not a single white hair on his body. What have you named him? I'm afraid that will please you no better than the others. But still, I will tell you. First, though, run to see if your dear mother is not coming. Miss Mouse nods and runs out. The cat creeps to the pot and eats all the fat. She then crosses to the window. What one begins, one must needs finish. Miss Mouse returns. Mother is nowhere to be seen. Now tell me what you named your youngest child. All out. All out? Why, that is more curious than the others. I have never seen it in print. Glaring at Miss Mouse. You never will. Frightened. What do you mean? Preparing to spring. I mean to put you down with the fat. Help! Help! Enter Mother Mouse just as the cat clutches her daughter and jumps out of the window with her. Mother Mouse crosses and looks into the empty grease pot, sighing sadly. Ah, <sighs> t'was ever thus. Show your grease pot, and you'll go with it. End of The Cat and the Mouse Play eight of children's classics in dramatic form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf. Narrator, Stage Directions. Ellen Preckle. Inga and Swallow, read by Sarah Terry. Her Mother, read by Jenny McGee. The Wicked Elf, 
Read by Wooly B. Peasant. Ellen Preckle. Gretel. Read by Lydia. First Stone. Read by Margaret Espayat. Second Stone. Ellen Preckle. Third Stone. Read by Todd. The Very Old Sparrow. Read by Wooly B. Old Sparrow. Read by Jenny McGee. Young Sparrow. Read by Little T. Very Young Sparrow. By Ethel Bus. The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf. Scene 1. Time, the day before Christmas. Place, Inga's mother's home. The mother stands at the kitchen window, watching for Inga. Ah, here she comes, at last. Short pause. Enter Inga. I have waited long for you, my child. Where have you been? Inga is silent. Have you been to Elf Hill? Tell me. Hesitating. Just for a little while, mother. Inga, Inga, what have I ever told you? I thought I'd go just this once. Showing sorrow. Ah, Inga, that's what you always say. There's no harm talking with the elves. And I, your mother, say there is harm. But, mother, they talk so prettily. Nodding. Ay, and that's the harm. They've put such silly ideas into your head. They say tis friendship makes them talk as they do. Indignantly. Friendship? Tis friendship, is it, to tell you not to fetch the wood? They say twill spoil my hands. Out upon them and their pretty talk. You shall go there no more. Do you hear me, Inga? Pouting. I hear. Now take this loaf of bread to your sick aunt. Say to her tis her Christmas gift. But, mother, I must cross the muddy road to go there. Well, you are neither sugar nor salt. I'll spoil my shoes. You think of your shoes and your aunt lies ill? Wait till spring and the mud will be gone. Wait till spring and your aunt will be gone. Here is the loaf. Now off with you. Inga takes the loaf and goes, but not willingly. Scene 2. Time a few minutes later. Place the muddy road. Inga is seen stopping at the muddy road. <sighs> Tis too wide to leap. The wicked elf suddenly appears on the opposite side of the road. Good day to you, pretty maid. Good day to you, dear elf. Wilt cross this muddy road? I must. Then I'll tell you how to do it, and not so much as wet your shoe. Oh, thank you, dear elf. Throw down your loaf and... Showing surprise, interrupting. Throw down the loaf? Why, yes, to use it for a stepping stone. But twill spoil the bread. But it will save your shoes. Well, that's true. A pretty maid ne'er wears a muddy shoe. That's true, too. Come, then, throw down the loaf. Well, I'll do it. She throws the loaf and steps upon it. Uh, Tis sinking, what shall I do? Why, then, jump off. Trying to jump. I can't. Don't you see I can't? Ha, ha, you're fastened to it. Tis drawing me down. Help me, help me. There's no help for you. No help? What do you mean? You must go down with the loaf. I pray you help me. See how I'm sinking. The mud will soon be over my shoes. The mud will soon be over your head. Weeping. <laughs> save me, save me. Will you be saved by magic? Yes, yes. Listen then, I'll change you into a bird. Are you willing? Yes, yes, quick now, before I sink deeper. Nodding head three times. A sparrow shall you be. Change, now change. Inga changes into a sparrow with a tuft of white feathers, just the shape of a loaf of bread upon its head. The sparrow flies from the mud. Now change me back into Inga. You shall remain as you are. Showing surprise. Remain as I am. Nodding. Until you can change yourself back. And when will that be? When the loaf has gone from your head. The loaf from my head? What do you mean? Going. Fly away to the brook and see. Ha, ha, ha. She runs away, calling back. Fly away to the brook and see. Ha, ha, ha. Scene 3. Time, the day following Christmas Day. Place, an old stone wall by a brook. The sparrow sits in a hole in the wall. Come, come, be not so sad, little sparrow. Come, lift up your head and sing. Come, sing us your Christmas song. Sing? 
I have nothing to sing about. Sing of your friends. Sing of their love for you. Sing of their kindness to you. Talk not to me of friends or love or kindness. There's none in the world. Enter a peasant in his little Gretel. The peasant carries two ears of corn. Now, my Gretel, we'll place the corn here on the old wall. Mother thought you brought too much. Well, tis true there are only three ears left at home, but the birds must have their Christmas dinner. He places the corn on the wall. There's none about to see it. Oh, some bird will soon find it. But will it call the others? We'll wait to see. Come, we'll sit there on the log. They go to a log nearby. There, little sparrow, say you now there is no kindness? Or love? Or friendship? No, no, I can never say that again. The peasant's heart is full of kindness and love and friendship. I will sing of it. T'will be my Christmas song. The sparrow leaves the hole and flies to the corn. Look, father, there is a sparrow, and hear it sing. Just hear it. It is calling the other birds. Why, it doesn't even touch the corn. It's waiting to share it with the others. Is it not a pretty sight? Come, we must go tell mother. Scene four. Time, one month later. Place, same as scene three. All the sparrows except our sparrow sit on the stone wall. I say the stranger should be driven away. So say I. The stranger is a sparrow, but still not a sparrow. And yet she is only different by a tuft of white feathers. And such a tuft, for all the world like a loaf of bread. I think it's shame to carry such on my head. I fear twill shame us all to have this stranger about. And yet we are not ashamed to eat the crumbs this stranger brings. Well, tis true, she has been most kind. Tis a hard winter. Shall we drive away the one who finds food where we find none? And calls us every time. And never eats till we have come. I've kept in mind the crumbs she has found us. Now how many do you think? I cannot say, for I did not think to notice. There only lacks two or three now of being a loaf. Greatly surprised. A loaf? Here comes the stranger now. She brings a crust. Our sparrow flies up with a crust in its bill. Come, friends, tis for all of you. Do you know, stranger bird, that with these crumbs you have brought us all in one loaf? Our sparrow drops the crust for the others. At once it changes into Inga. The birds fly away frightened. Oh, now I understand. The loaf had to be made up crumb by crumb. The wicked elf suddenly appears. Come, pretty maid, come to the elf hill. No, no, I will not. But we have such pretty things to tell you. I care not for your pretty things. I go to fetch wood for my mother. I go to walk in the mud if need be. Away with you. I'll have none of you. Away, away, I say. End of The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf Play 9 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Ugly Duckling. Narrator. Stage Directions. Ellen Preckle. Madam Duck. Read by Maria Therese. First Duckling by Ethel Voss. Second Duckling. Read by Lydia. Third Duckling. Read by Little T. Ugly Duckling. Read by Sarah Terry. Turkey Read by Wooly Bee. Grey Gander. Read by Jenny McGee. White Goose. Read by Margaret Espayat. Plymouth Rock Hen. Read by Todd. Red Rooster. Ellen Preckle. Peasant. Ellen Preckle. His Wife. Read by Rebecca Braunard Plunkett. Elizabeth. Read by Maria Therese. The Cat. Read by Wooly Bee. The Hen. Read by Margaret Espayat. The Mole. Read by Todd. Father. Read by Todd. The Mother. Read by Rebecca Braunard Plunkett. First Child. 
by Ethel Bruce. Second child, read by Lydia. Third child, read by Little T. Fourth child, read by Margaret Espayat. First swan by Ethel Bruce. Second swan, read by Lydia. Third swan, read by Little T. The Ugly Duckling, Scene 1. Time, One Summer Morning. Place, The Farmyard of the Moor Farm. Madam Duck enters the farmyard with her new brood of ducklings. The other fowls approach, showing displeasure. A new brood of ducks. Look, you all, a new brood of ducks. Also displeased. As if there were not enough of us here already. Likewise displeased. True enough. I can scarce find a corner for my afternoon nap. It seems to me, Madam Duck, that you should not have brought us a new brood this summer. What is that you are saying? It seems to all of us, madam, that there is no room here for a new brood. Friends, be just. Madam Duck has a perfect right to bring her ducklings here. Besides, the children are quite pretty. They are beautiful. You shall see that for yourselves. Come, children, into a row with you. The ducklings form themselves into a row. The ugly duckling is last. Legs wide apart. Toes out. Now speak prettily to my old friends. There now, are they not charming? Why, yes, they all seem graceful enough. Here, wait a minute. Does that last one there belong to you? All the fowls look at the last duckling. Oh, yes, he is larger than the others, and perhaps not so pretty, but... Make no excuses for him, madam. We can see for ourselves what he is. In all my life, I never saw anything so ugly. He is neither duck nor goose. Nor duck nor chick. I'd be ashamed to have a turkey look like that. I'd allow no hen of mine to claim him. Come now, come now, friends. The poor child is not pretty, but he is good, and he can swim even better than the others. That he can swim well is nothing to me. Nor to me. He should be driven out, I say. Let him alone. He is not doing any harm. But, mother, no one will look at us if he stay with us. Now perhaps it may turn out that way. I'll not walk about with him. Nor I. Well, well, he must be uglier than I thought. Besides, dear mother, he will not quack. What is this? Did he not quack but just a moment ago? He turned his toes out, but quack he would not. It is true, dear mother. Quack, quack now, at once. The ugly duckling tries to quack, but jokes. The fowls laugh and jeer at him. Ha, ha. There's quack for you. Ha, ha. Ha, ha. Ha, ha. Ha, ha. Once more, I tell you, quack. The ugly duckling tries again, chokes. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'd quack if I could. Ah, oh, if you were only far away. I wish the cat would eat you. I wish the swans would kill you. And they will when they see him. You may be sure of that. I they'll not suffer such an ugly creature to swim in the brook. We must drive him off. That's clear. Running at the ugly duckling. Come now, out with you. Out with you. Pecking, duckling. Mother, save me. Call not on me. Out with you. Striking duckling with his wings. Brothers, sisters, save me. Running to ducklings. Come not to us. We'll not save you. Away with you. At him, hens to peck him. At him, geese to beat him. At him, all of you. They all rush upon the ugly duckling who escapes them, running out of the farmyard into the moor. Scene two. Time, the next winter, place the peasant's cottage. The peasant enters the cottage carrying the ugly duckling. See what I am bringing you. Why? Tis a duckling, half frozen too. I found him frozen in the pond. I had to break the ice to get him out. Give him to me, father. I will put him behind the stove. That's a good child. 
giving duckling to Elizabeth. Handle him tenderly, daughter. Taking off her shawl. He shall lie upon my shawl, you poor, dear, ugly little duckling. She places the duckling upon the shawl behind the stove near the cat and hen. Tis the duckling I told you of. The one you saw on the pond yesterday? Aye, and the day before, and all winter long, for that matter. Yesterday I saw him try to join the wild ducks on the river, but they drove him back to the pond. Poor duckling! The pond was freezing then. Then he tried to find a place among the rushes on the moor, but the birds drove him from there. Why do they all treat him so, father? I do not know, unless it is because he is so ugly. Come now to dinner, father, Elizabeth. By the time we have finished, our duckling will be warmed and awake. They go into the kitchen. The duckling stirs and looks about. Can you lay eggs? No, madam. Can you sit up your back? No, dear sir. Can you purr? No. Then you can't stay here. Do not drive me out, I pray you. Will you learn to purr? And to lay eggs? Alas, I can do nothing but swim. Swim? Well, I must say that is very queer. Oh, no, dear sir. It is most pleasant when the waters close over your head and you plunge to the bottom. Plunge to the bottom, indeed. I'd never think of doing such a silly thing. Nor I, Burr. Tis clear you can't remain here. Where am I to go? Go lie in the rushes. The birds flew south this morning. I shall starve there. It would really be a good thing for you if I should eat you. I'd thank you to do so, dear sir. Eat him, since he is so willing. He is too ugly to live. I can't. He is too ugly to eat. To the duckling. Come, out with you. Yes, yes, out with you, out with you. Running at him. They push the duckling out of the door into the snow. Alas, what shall I do? Where shall I go? Why was I made so ugly that everyone despises me? Scene 3. Time, the next spring. Place, the brook on the moor farm. The ugly duckling sits on the hill of a mole near the brook which winds through the moor farm. From the mole hill. Why out there is a mole? I want to come out. Oh, why, tis a mole hill I've been sitting on. Rising quickly, the mole comes out from the hill. I'm sorry, friend mole. I didn't notice your hill. Who are you? Madam Duck of this farm is my mother. That can't be. You are no duck. Yes, but I am. Only, I am uglier than any duck in the world. You have not the voice of a duck. You do not speak with the quack of which they are so proud. And then, if you are truly a duck, why are you not with your family? They drove me out last summer because I was ugly and could not clack. Then why have you come back? <sighs> to let the swans kill me. What? To let them kill you? I would rather be killed by those beautiful birds than pecked by the hens, beaten by the geese, or starved with hunger in the winter. Perhaps you are not so ugly now as you were then. I have not looked at myself in the water since spring came and took the ice away, but I know well enough how dark and badly formed I am. The swans will kill me if I dare to approach them. A noise is heard in the distance. They are coming. Go while there is yet time. There is no place to go to. All winter long I was driven from moor to moor. I could not make a friend. I no longer wish to live. The swans are seen swimming down the brook. They are here. Do not go to them, I pray you. Farewell. Shaking head. He flies to the water and swims toward the swans. They see him and rush to meet him with outstretched wings. Kill me, kill me. Kill you? Why? 
we have come to welcome you beautiful stranger we saw you from afar and came to meet you we are so happy to have you with us enter several children see there is a new swan father mother come there is another swan enter the father and mother what were you calling a new swan has come look i see him he is beautiful he is very young but he is the most beautiful of all see how the others stroke him with their beaks they are showing him how glad they are to have him with them see how they swim around him and how gently they touch him i have never seen anything so pretty how happy the new swan is see how he rustles his feathers see how proudly he curves his slender neck and see how he looks at himself in the water let's get bread and cake for him yes 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 the children run off followed by the father and mother twas not so bad after all not to have the family quack going into his hill end of the ugly duckling Play 10 of children's classics in dramatic form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ellen Preckle. Grandmother. Read by Margaret Espayat. Shoemaker. Read by Todd. Karen. Read by Lydia. First Neighbor. Read by Margaret Espayat. Second Neighbor. Read by David Lawrence. The Third Neighbor. Read by Arnaldo Machado. Fourth Neighbor. Read by K. Hand. The Old Soldier. Read by Wade Campbell. Coachman. Read by K. Hand. The Son. Read by Wade Campbell. The Forester. Read by David Lawrence. The Moon. Read by Wade Campbell. The Executioner. Read by Todd. Fairy Queen. Read by Lydia. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson The Red Shoes Scene 1. Time, 1 morning. Place, the shoemaker's shop. The grandmother and Karen enter the shop of the shoemaker. This is my little granddaughter Karen, shoemaker. Please to take her measure for a pair of shoes. What kind do you wish, madam? Morocco, the finest you have. Karen is to wear these shoes to church what color do you wish madam black whispering to shoemaker red eh black whispering to shoemaker red of course madam if you say black black they shall be little princess wore red shoes grandmother nodding that is true i saw them myself red shoes nodding of beautiful red morocco the queen let the princess stand at a window so everyone could see her new shoes it is all true madam no matter karen is to have black shoes taking up a pair of shoes here this pair suits me exactly but madam those shoes are interrupting whispering hush shoemaker do not tell her she can't see very well giving shoes to karen are they of polished leather? They shine as if they were. Yes, they do shine. Trying on the shoes. And they just fit me, Grandmother. I will take them, Shoemaker. But, Madam... Interrupting, whispering. Hush, Shoemaker. She will never know the difference. Here's the money, Shoemaker. Come, Karen. But, Madam... Interrupting. I am ready, Grandmother. Good day, shoemaker. But, madam! Interrupting. Good day, shoemaker. The grandmother and Karen go. Scene 2. Time, the next Sunday after church. Place, the grandmother's home. The neighbors sit with the grandmother in the spare room because it is Sunday. I did not see you at church today, grandmother. I could not go, but I sent little Karen. Oh, yes, we saw her everybody saw her people do look at her she's so pretty people didn't look at her face today what do you mean 
As Karen, when she returns, we're not the ones to carry tales. Looking out window. Here she comes now. Just ask her about the sermon and the hymns. She will tell me almost every word the pastor said. She is a smart girl, that Karen. Enter Karen. Well, Grandmother, here I am. Good morning, neighbors. Good morning, Karen. Now, tell me about the sermon, Karen. What was the text? The, the text? It was... it was... Oh, I will tell you all about it by and by, Grandmother. Our neighbors want to talk with you just now. Oh, no. We would rather hear you tell your grandmother about the sermon and the music. What hymns did they sing, Karen? Hymns? They sang... let me see. They sang... She stops in confusion. Why, Karen, are you ill? No, Grandmother. Karen is not ill. She is ashamed. She was not thinking of the beautiful music, nor of the sermon this morning. Is that not true, Karen? Yes. What is this? Tell your grandmother what you were thinking about in church, Karen. I, I was thinking about my new shoes. A great thing to think about in church, a pair of plain black shoes. She did not wear her black shoes. She wore red shoes. Gasping. <gasps> red shoes? To church? Nodding. Everyone was terribly shocked. Still gasping. Oh, red shoes to church! Even the pastor looked at her shoes. Red shoes to church! The choir looked. All fixed their eyes on Karen's red shoes. It is the most shocking thing I ever heard. Do you hear me, Karen? Hanging her head in shame. Yes, Grandmother. You must never, never, so long as you live, wear red shoes to church again. It is not at all proper. Do you hear me, Karen? Yes, Grandmother. Do you think she should have her Sunday dinner? Not one bite. She shall stay in her room all day. Do you hear me, Karen? Yes, Grandmother. Thank you for telling me, neighbors. To think of it. Red shoes to church. Scene three. Time, the following Sunday after church. Place, the churchyard. The grandmother and Karen come from the church. The old soldier stands near the church door. He tries to speak to the grandmother, but she does not hear him. Wait a moment, grandmother. The old soldier wants to speak with you. Turning. What do you want, old soldier? I want to dust your shoes, madam. That is very good of you. Old soldier dusts her shoes. Thank you. Now I will go to my carriage while you dust Karen's shoes. She goes. Stretch out your foot, little Karen. Karen thrusts out her foot. What is this? Red shoes for church? I looked at my old black shoes. Interrupting. And then at your new red ones? Nodding. Y yes, and then at my black ones again. Interrupting. And then put on your red ones. Shh! Grandmother must not know. She can't hear, for I'm talking through my long red beard. Why is your beard so red, old soldier? To make more light for my eyes, that I may see without looking. See without looking? Nodding. I was not in the church, yet I saw you clearly when you knelt at the altar and raise the golden cup to your lips. You saw that? Nodding. And more. I saw your thoughts. You saw my thoughts? Nodding. It was to you as if your red shoes passed before your eyes in the cup. Am I not right? Yes. And I saw by the light of my beard that you forgot to sing the hymns. A eh, Karen? Yes. And that you forgot to say your prayers. A eh, Karen? Yes. You were thinking of your red shoes all the time. Yes, old soldier. Holding Karen and stooping until his beard covers her shoes. 
Cover and touch and change, my beard. Cover and touch and change. What are you doing? Let me go. Holding her firmly. I am turning your red shoes into dancing shoes. I am afraid of you. Let me go. Slapping soles of her shoes with hand. Now I have made them stick fast to your feet. Calling. Grandmother! Grandmother! Now you may go. <laughs> Why, I'm dancing. I can't stop. Grandmother! Grandmother! What is this? Mercy on me. She's dancing down the street. Run after her, coachman. Quick, stop her. Running after Karen. Stop, Mistress Karen. I'm after you. Ha <laughs> ha! You will never catch her! Calling after Coachman. There she goes round the corner! Calling off. I'll get you, Mistress Karen. Just stop a bit. Ha <laughs> ha! You will never catch her! My poor Karen! My poor Karen! Returning. I couldn't catch her, madam. She danced right out of the town gate. Out of the town gate? Yes, madam, and straight for the dark wood. We will drive after her. Coachman jumps to his seat. <laughs> you will never catch her. Quick, coachman, quick! We must catch her before she gets to the dark wood. My poor Karen! My poor Karen! The carriage dashes off. Scene 4. Time, three days later, evening. Place, the dark wood. A hut is seen among the vines. The forester and his son are felling a tree. Heard calling off. Stop me! Stop me! Heard you that cry? Looking off. Mercy on us! Tis the dancing girl I told you of. Enter Karen, dancing. Stop me, forester! No, no, I dare not. To son. Stop me, I pray you! Three days have I danced. I can endure it no longer. To Forrester. Come, let us help her. Do not touch her. She is bewitched. To my shoes are bewitched, not I. I say, little maid, pull off your shoes. They will not come off. See? She pulls at her shoes, starting toward Karen. I'll get them off. Bewitched or not bewitched. Seizing son. Would you get yourself into trouble? Come home with me. Forrester runs from wood with sun. The moon arises suddenly in a fir tree. Oh, moon, see how I dance below you. Pray tell me how to break this spell. <laughs> the moon changes into the red beard of the old soldier. My beard makes moonlight for me that I may watch you dance. Mercy, old soldier, I pray you break your spell. You forgot to say the prayers. You thought only of your red shoes. I will go barefoot to church. You whispered red to the shoemaker. I will never deceive my dear grandmother again. Have pity. You shall dance in your red shoes till you're pale and cold. By night and by day you shall dance, in the sunshine and in rain, in snow and in sleet, over highways and byways shall you dance, in dark swamps and on mountain tops. You shall go on dancing, dancing, dancing forever and ever. He disappears. I cannot dance on forever. I cannot. I cannot. Weeping. Pause. Well, I know a way to break the spell, and I'll do it. Crossing to hut of the executioner, knocking. Come out! Come out! From within the hut. Come in. I cannot come in. I must dance. Then I will come out. The executioner comes out from hut. Well, do you know me? You are the executioner. I am the executioner. I cut off the heads of wicked people with this great axe. Do not strike off my head. And why not strike off your head, pray? I must have that to repent of my sin. So please to cut off my feet. 
It shall be as you say. Thrust out your foot, maid. Enter Fairy Queen. Stay, executioner, stay. I've come to save you, Karen. To save me? Whenever a child repents of a sin, lo, I am there to save. Will you remove the spell from me? Will you give up your red shoes? Gladly, gladly, I wish I might never see them again. Then dance to me, that I may touch you with my wand. Fairy Queen touches Karen's shoes with her wand. The shoes fall off. Dear Fairy Queen, dear Fairy Queen, I thank you, I thank you. Look, Karen, your shoes are dancing away. Soon they will be lost to you forever. Shall I not bring them back? No, no, let them go. Now I am free. Now I can rest. Then come, dear child. I will guide you to your home. End of The Red Shoes Play 11 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. His Wife, read by Margaret Espayat. The Merchant, read by Marianne. Zen, read by K. Hand. The Caliph, read by David Lawrence. Grand Vizier, read by Wade Campbell. First Child, read by Shakira Searle. Second Child, Officer, read by Janet. Third Child, and Ali Kojia, read by Lydia. Boy Number One, read by Todd. Boy Number Two, read by Arnaldo Machado. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Story of Ali Gogia. Scene 1. Time. One evening. Place. The house of a merchant in Baghdad. The merchant and his wife are at supper. Our neighbors bought some fine olives today. It has been a long time since we have had olives. I'm quite hungry for them. Hmm. Now you speak of olives. You put me in mind of the jar which Ali Kogia left with me pointing to a jar in another part of the room. There is the very jar waiting for him against his return. Certainly he must be dead, since he has not returned all this time. Give me a plate. I will open the jar, and if the olives be good, we will eat them. Pray, husband, do not commit so base an action. You know nothing is more sacred than what is left to one's care and trust. But I am certain Ali Kogia will never return. And I have a strong feeling that he will. What will he think of your honor if he finds the jar has been opened? Surely a jar of olives is not to be guarded so carefully, year after year. That is Ali Kogia's affair, not ours. Besides, the olives can't be good after all this time. Taking a plate. I mean to have a taste of them, at least. You are betraying the trust your friend has placed in you. I will not remain to witness it. She leaves the room. The merchant crosses and takes the cover from the jar. Looking in jar. Hmm. My wife was right. The olives are covered with mold. But those at the bottom may still be good. He turns the jar up and shakes out the olives. Several gold pieces fall out. What is this? Gold pieces, as I live. Gold, gold. He shakes the jar again. A shower of gold pieces fall, dropping the jar in astonishment. A thousand pieces at least. The top of the jar only was laid with olives. He puts the gold into his pockets. Tonight, when my wife is asleep, I will fill the jar entirely with fresh olives, for these show they have been disturbed, and I will make up the jar so that no one, except Ali Kogia himself, will know they have been touched. Scene 2. Time. One month later, a moonlight night. Place. A small court opening upon a narrow street of Baghdad. The caliph, accompanied by his grand vizier, enters the narrow street upon which the court opens. They are in disguise, appearing as merchants. 
Perhaps we may hear talk of this affair of Ali Kogia and the merchant as we go through the city tonight. It is possible, Lord Commander of True Believers. The affair had made great noise in Baghdad. Ali Kogia carried the merchant before the Kozi, I believe. Yes, he claimed that the merchant had taken from him one thousand pieces of gold. Proceed, I would know all. Ali Kograd left with his merchant, so he says, in a jar which he placed his money. Upon his return, which was but yesterday, he went to the merchant, and having received the jar, opened it. To his surprise, he found that the gold, which he had hidden below a layer of olives, was no longer there. Ah, that is what Ali Kogia says. What says the merchant? The merchant made an oath before the Kozi that he did not know there was money in the jar, and so, of course, could not have taken it. And the Kozi dismissed the merchant, I believe. Yes, commander of the faithful, the merchant was acquitted. This Ali Kogia presented a petition to me today, and I promise to hear him tomorrow. Would that I could know the truth of the matter, that I may give a just sentence. They arrive at the court where several children are playing in the moonlight. The caliph stops to watch them. Let us play that the Kozi is trying the merchant. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Softly to vizier. Let us sit on this bench. I would know what these children are playing. They sit, but are not seen by children. Taking his seat with great dignity. I choose to be the Kozi. Taking his place behind the Kozi. I choose to be the officer. I choose to be Ali Kojia. Who chooses to be the merchant? Long pause. All the children hang back. Come, Tsein. You be the merchant. Not I. The part does not please me. Would you spoil everything, Zen? Oh, well, then. I'll be the merchant this time. Officer, bring in the accused and his accuser. The officer presents the merchant and Ali Kojia before the Kazi. Ali Kojia, what charge have you to make against this merchant? Bowing. Sir, when I journeyed from Baghdad seven years ago, I left with this merchant a jar. Now into this jar I had put, with some olives, a thousand pieces of gold. When I opened the jar, I found it had been entirely filled with olives. The gold had disappeared. I beseech your honor that I may not lose so great a sum of money. Merchant, what have you to say to this charge? I confess that I had the jar in my house, but Ali Kojia found it exactly as he had left it. Did he ever tell me there was gold in the jar? No. He now demands that I pay him one thousand pieces of gold. I wonder that he does not ask me for diamonds and pearls instead of gold. I will take my oath that what I say is the truth. Not so fast. Before you come to your oath, I should be glad to see the jar of olives. Turning to Ali Kojia. Ali Kojia, have you brought the jar? No, I did not think of that. Then go and fetch it. Ali Kojia goes to the merchant. You thought the jar contained olives all this time? Ali Kojia told me it contained olives at the first. I will take oath that what I say is the truth. We are not yet ready for your oath. Ali Kojia enters. He pretends to set a jar before the Kozi. Ali Kojia, is this jar the same you left with the merchant? Sir, it is the same. Merchant, do you confess this jar to be the same? Sir, it is the same. Officer, remove the cover. The officer pretends to remove the cover. These are fine olives. Let me taste them. Pretending to eat an olive. They are excellent. But I cannot think that olives will keep seven years and be so good. Therefore... Officer, bring in olive merchants, and let me hear what is their opinion. Forward to olive merchants. The boys present themselves. Are you olive merchants? Bowing. Sir, Sir we, we are. are. 
Tell me how long olives will keep. Let us take what care we can. They will hardly be worth anything the third year. It is true, for then they will have neither taste nor color. If it be so, look into that jar and tell me how long it is since those olives were put into it. Both merchants pretend to examine and taste the olives. These olives are new and good. You are mistaken. Ali Kojia says he put them into the jar seven years ago. Sir, they are of this year's growth. There is not a merchant in Baghdad that would not say the same. Merchant, you stand accused. You must return the thousand pieces of gold to Ali Kojia. Sir, I protest. Interrupting. Be silent. You are a rogue. Take him to prison, officer. All the children seize the merchant and run from the court, laughing and shouting. Rising. I know now what will be a just trial. I have learned it from this child, Cozy. Do you think I could give a better sentence? I think not, if the case be as these children played it. Take care to bid Ali Kogia bring his jar of olives tomorrow, and let two olive merchants attend. It shall be done, O commander of true believers. If the olives be indeed fresh, then the merchant will receive his punishment, and Ali Kogia his thousand pieces of gold. Starting off, stopping. Take notice of this street, and tomorrow present the boy Kozi with a purse of gold. Tell him it is a token of my admiration of his wisdom and justice. End of the story of Ali Kojia. Play 12 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Eliza, read by Shakira Searle. The Goody, read by Margaret Espayat. The Fairy, read by Tricia G. King, read by Lydia. Wicked Uncle. Executioner, read by Maria Therese. First Citizen, read by Todd. Second Citizen, read by K. Hand. Third Citizen, read by K. Cotter. Fourth Citizen, read by Maria Therese. Ninth Brother, read by Lydia. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson The Wild Swans Scene 1 Time, a long time ago Place, on the seashore The goody is seen walking along the shore Eliza enters from the forest Bless me! What is the little girl doing in this lonely place? And alone, too! I seek my eleven brothers Ah, then you must be the Princess Eliza. Yes, Goody. And the eleven brothers you seek are the eleven little princes. Yes. Do you know them? I saw them in school one day. Each prince wore a golden crown on his head, a star on his breast, and a sword by his side. Nodding. They studied very hard, just as princes should. They wrote on gold slates with diamond pencils. I myself saw them. I sat on a little stool of plate glass. Did you know that? Oh, yes, and I know about your picture book worth half a kingdom. We were all so happy then. Our dear mother was alive, and sometimes went to school with us. Now all is changed. What has happened? They have driven us from the palace. I said so. On the day of that wedding I said so. Then you know that my father married again. Yes, I know. 
I wept when I heard our good king had married that wicked queen. She drove my brothers away the very day of the wedding feast. And now she has driven you away. Nodding. If only I could find my dear brothers. You may hear something about them very soon. Do you know where they are? Tell me. I pray you, tell me. Shaking her head mysteriously. I cannot say where they are. I only know what they are. I do not understand. The wicked queen has turned your brothers into wild swans. Wild swans? Nodding. I saw them yesterday, at sunrise, flying out over the sea. Each swan wore a gold crown on his head. The queen could not take their crowns from them. As the swans flew upward, their eleven crowns glittered like eleven suns. My eyes were dazzled. I was obliged to look away. At that moment the swans disappeared. Sadly to herself. My poor brothers, I shall never see them again. Suddenly. Do you see those great blue bluffs to the south? Yes, the sea is dashing against them. In those bluffs, back from the shore, is a cave. Go at once to that cave and enter. And what shall I do there, good woman? Perhaps you may learn how to break the spell over your brothers. How to break the spell? Ask no questions, but go at once to the cave. Going. Thank you, good woman. You are very kind to me. Go now, child, and fear nothing. Eliza goes, the goody disappears. Scene 2. Time, a half hour later. Place, the cave. Eliza is seen at entrance of cave. She stops, is afraid to enter. I am afraid to enter. It is so dark. I know not what is within. It may be the den of some wild animal. Listening. Not a sound do I hear. But wild animals are cunning. They know how to lie as still as death, and then to leap quickly. Pause. Well, be it so. I will enter, for I must save my brothers. She enters the cave. Fairy is within the cave, but invisible. You have courage, little Eliza. Oh, are you here, good woman? Behold. The cave is filled with light. A beautiful fairy is seen. Ah, I thought it was the goody. No matter, dear child. I knew you were to come here. I was afraid to enter. But you did enter. Your love for your brothers was greater than your fear. It was that which gave me courage. It was a test of your courage. And now I can tell you how to break the spell over your brothers. I will do whatever you say. You will suffer greatly. What matter if I save my brothers? Nodding. Then listen, do you see the stinging nettles which I hold in my hand? Yes, dear fairy. You must gather great quantities of these. I noticed many of the same sort growing near this cave. Shaking head. You must gather only those that grow in graveyards. It shall be exactly as you say, dear fairy. The nettles will make blisters on your hands. 
I will not think of myself. I will think only of my brothers. Break the nettles into pieces with your hands and feet, and they will become flax. From this flax you must spin and weave eleven coats with long sleeves. If these eleven coats can be thrown over the eleven swans, the spell will be broken. It shall be done. But remember that from the moment you begin your task until it is finished, you must not speak. Even though it should occupy years of your life, you must not speak. I shall remember. The first word you utter will pierce through the hearts of your brothers like a dagger. Their lives hang upon your tongue. Go now and begin your task. Going. I go, dear fairy. Remember all I have told you, dear child. Farewell. Eliza goes, the cave becomes dark, the fairy disappears. Scene 3. Time, two days later. Place, a distant country, the king's palace. The wicked uncle stands waiting to receive the king. Enter the king with Eliza. She is pale and sad. Welcome, your majesty. Welcome home from your hunt. But who is this maiden? I know not, my uncle. What? My huntsman found her in a cave in a far-off country. In a cave? Alone? Nodding. Alone, spinning coats out of flax. This is very strange. To Eliza. Why were you all alone in a cave, and why were you spinning coats? Eliza shakes her head. She is dumb, uncle. Not a word has she uttered since we found her. Why did you bring her with you? I will make her my queen. Your queen? See how beautiful she is. Whispering to King. She is a witch. Nonsense. She is as good as she is beautiful. Whispering as before. She has bewitched your heart. Nonsense, I say. She did not want to leave the cave. She wept bitterly when I put her on my horse. He turns to the servants. Let the music sound. Prepare the wedding feast. He turns to Eliza, who weeps. Do not weep, my beautiful maid. Whispering to King. She is not beautiful. She has bewitched your eyes. I will not listen to you. Go, bid them ring the church bells. Going, speaking aside. I must poison his heart against her in some way, else I'll never wear the crown. Wicked uncle goes to Eliza. Do not weep. You shall be dressed in silks and velvets, and I will place a golden crown upon your head. Eliza weeps and wrings her hands. Well, then, I know how to make you smile. The king opens a door into an inner room. Eliza looks in, smiles, and claps her hands for joy. I thought it would make you happy. "'Tis very like your cave. I had it made so." Eliza tries to thank the king with her eyes. "'But no more spinning. Your fingers shall be covered with diamonds instead of blisters.' Eliza sighs very sadly. "'Something troubles you, little queen. If you could only tell me of your grief.' Eliza shakes her head sadly. "'Well, I can at least save you from a life of labor. You shall be most tenderly cared for. Calling. Ho there, guardsman! Enter guardsman. Guardsman, behold your queen. Guards kneel before Eliza. Guardsman, arise and hear my commands. Guards rise. Your queen is never to do any of the work about the castle. Do you hear me, guardsman? Bowing. 
We hear, O King. King. Not even the spinning or weaving. Do you hear me, guardsmen? Bowing. We hear, O King. King. Those are my commands. Now attend us to the banquet hall. To Eliza, who is weeping. Weep no more, little queen. I wish only your happiness. Come, give me your hand. We go now to the wedding feast. They go out, the guards attending. Scene 4. Time, two weeks later, sunrise. Place, the open just without the town gate. Enter crowds of people from the town gate. Enter the goody from the forest. Enter the wicked uncle from the town gate. To wicked uncle. Why these crowds so early, sir? Do not call me, sir. What shall I say, sir? Say, your highness. But you are not the king, sir. I'm very near it, old woman. Not so near, sir, as you were, sir. There is the new queen, sir. The new queen is about to die. About to die? Nodding. Aye, because she is a witch. They're bringing her out here now. The king permits it? Nodding. He soon found out the truth about her. And what was that? Just what I told him the first time I saw her. She's a witch, said I, but he would not believe me. What has so changed him? Twas I who saw her slip forth from the castle one midnight. I followed her. Straight to the graveyard she went. To the graveyard? Nodding. In she went, I following. I saw her gather the stinging nettles that grow there. But they would blister her hands. Did she not cry out? Not a sound did she utter. That would prove her a witch were there nothing more. Ah, there is something more, then. Nodding mysteriously. I followed her back to the castle, through the marble halls, and up to the little cave room. I saw her break up the nettles. Then I saw her spin and weave this flax into a magic coat. Bless me! A magic coat? Nodding. There were ten of them hanging from the ceiling. Of course you told the king. Just as soon as I could waken him, but he would not believe me. He said there was but one coat when they brought her here, and that there could be but one now. She worked at night, then, while the castle slept. True queens do not work. Nay, can't be made to work. Everyone knows that. But how did the king find out the truth? I persuaded him to watch with me the next night. Just at midnight the queen came out. We followed her to the graveyard. That is enough, said his majesty. She is a witch and must die. The citizens rush to the gates. Calling. See the witch! Is she coming? Looking. Yes, she is just within the gate. She rides in an old cart drawn by an old horse. Quite good enough for a witch. Enter the king with servants and guards. Behind them is the cart. In the cart sits Eliza. She is spinning and weaving, never once looking up. How pale she is! Bless me! She is spinning and weaving. It is the eleventh coat, and it will be the last. How she hurries to finish it! The cart stops. To Eliza. Once again I ask you, are you a witch? Eliza shakes her head. Then give up the coats. They are of no use to any one. Eliza again shakes her head. That proves her a witch, else she would give up the coats. 
to Eliza. Once more, will you not give them up? Eliza shakes her head. The king turns away. He's very sad. His eyes are filled with tears. Calling. See, the witch! Calling. See, her magic coats. Calling. Let us tear them to pieces. Calling. At them, citizens, tear them to shreds. Looking up, speaking aside. Here come the wild swans. Now we shall see what we shall see. Eleven wild swans descend from the sky and alight on the cart. Each wears a golden crown. Back, citizens, back! Wild swans have alighted on the cart! What do we care for wild swans? Forward, citizens! Back, I say! The swans are beating us with their strong wings! Back! Back, citizens! We dare not approach the cart! Calling to the people. The swans have come to save the queen. Tis a sign from heaven that she is innocent. Be silent, old woman. He turns to the executioner. Executioner, do your duty. Out of the cart, witch. Eliza shakes her head, takes up coats from floor of cart. The executioner turns to the wicked uncle. She will not come. Seize her, I command you. Seize her, seize her. Look, citizens, look. She is spreading the coats over the swans. Eliza throws the eleven coats over the eleven swans, who turn to eleven little princes, but the youngest has a swan's wing instead of an arm, for the last sleeve was not finished. Do you see that, citizens? They are princes. She has saved them. She is no witch. She's an angel from heaven. Dear, Dear sister, sister, you, you have, have saved, saved us. us. Now I may speak. I am innocent. To King. Yes, she is innocent. How you have suffered for us, dear Eliza. To Eliza. Forgive us. To Eliza. Forgive me. I did not understand. Annoyed, but trying to conceal it. And I did not understand. I... I... Be silent. To guards. Seize him. The guards seize the wicked uncle. Take him to the mountains where the stinging nettles grow. Mercy, mercy. You had no mercy on brave little Eliza. Now you shall gather nettles for the rest of your life. Away with him, guardsmen. The guards take the wicked uncle away. The king turns to his servants. Let the music sound. Bring forth the queen's golden crown. To Eliza. My whole kingdom shall do you honor. This land has never seen a more beautiful thing than your love for your brothers. Whispering aside. Ring, church bells, ring of yourselves. All the church bells are heard ringing. Hear, Hear the, the church, church bells, bells. They, they ring, ring of, themselves. of themselves. They ring for this sweet queen, whose heart is as good as her face is beautiful. Come, citizens, away now to the castle, away to the banquet hall. End of The Wild Swans Play 13 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. First Countryman, read by Shakira Searle. Second Countryman, read by Tricia G. First City Wag, read by Margaret Espyat. 
Second City Wag, read by Lydia. Merchant Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson The Two Countrymen The Two Countrymen Scene 1. Time. Evening. Place. A large city. A quiet corner with a high wall back. Great crowds of people are seen in the streets. The two countrymen have just arrived. They find a quiet corner where they place their blankets and baskets of gourds which they carry. I fear something most dreadful must have happened in that street. See what crowds of people pass that way. Perhaps there is a fire, and yet... He stops, showing he is puzzled. What troubles thee? Look thou into that other street. It, too, is full of people, and yet none are gone from here. Some awful accident hath called them from all parts of the city. We must find out what it may be. A merchant passes. To merchant. I pray thee stop, citizen. The merchant stops. Canst thou tell us what dreadful thing hath befallen this city? What do you mean? Two city wags pass. They stop to listen. Whither do they go, these vast multitudes? What dreadful thing go they to see? <gasps> Perhaps they flee from some monster just come out of the sea. It is ever thus, always the great crowd surging through the streets. The merchant goes. Two countrymen winking aside at first wag. This is your first visit to a city, I take it? Bowing. It, it is, is good, good sirs. sirs. Winking aside at second wag. You know what happens to strangers in our city, of course. No, good sir. Pray tell us what it may be. "'Tis said they become so dazed by the noise of the city and the rush of such countless numbers they forget who they are." "'Eh? Forget who they are?' Nodding. "'Aye.' He winks aside at second wag. "'You've heard of this, dear friend?' Winking aside. To be sure, tis quite common. Forget their own faces? Aye, their faces. At least, they are not certain as to whose faces theirs may be. Then we dare not leave this corner. I would not advise it. It would be most unsafe, at least for tonight. Of course there is this danger. When you awake in the morning, you may not know whether you are yourselves. Would that I had never left my farm. Would that I had never left my wife. Do not despair. There is a way out of your troubles. Tell, Tell us, we, we pray, pray thee. Each of you must take a gourd from his basket there and tie it around his ankle. Then in the morning when you awake, you will each know that it is yourself and none other. Two second countrymen. Dost thou hear? By our gods we shall know. I hear. Thanks, and yet again more thanks to thee, good sir. The wags turn to go. May you know yourselves in the morning for what you truly are. They go, laughing aside. Each countryman ties a gourd round his ankle, wraps his blanket round him, and lies down. They sleep. Pause. Enter the wags, softly, each carrying a small flag. They remove the gourds from the countrymen's ankles and hide them under their blankets. They then tie the flags around the countrymen's ankles and go, greatly pleased with their joke. Scene 2. Time, the next morning. Place, the same as scene 1. The wags are seen peeping around the corner. They are sound asleep. 
then come. They enter and throw the two baskets of gourds over the wall. They then retire around the corner, peeping as before. Waking, shaking second countryman. Wake up! Wake up! Each yawns, stretches, throws off his blanket, arises. Remembering. Ah! The gourds! Each looks at his ankle, then at the other's ankle. How's this? Did we not tie gourds around our ankles? Nodding. Why, surely we did. Looking about. Did we not have two baskets of gourds with us? Nodding. Surely they're in the corner. Holding up foot to which flag is tied. Is this a gourd or is it not a gourd? Of surety it is a flag. Holding up his foot with flag. And if this be not a gourd, keep thy silence. The first countryman stares at the flag, placing his finger on his closed lips. Then it hath indeed happened. What hath happened? The dreadful thing foretold by the citizens. I am not I. Thou art not thou. Trembling with fear. How can that be? I know not. I only know that it is. Weeping. I cannot think I am not myself. Weeping. Thou needst must think it, whether thou wouldst or no. Dost thou indeed think thou art some other person? If I were myself, would not the gourd still be around my ankle? Then who art thou? And who am I? Alas, I know not. Enter the wags. Here come those who will know whether we are ourselves. The wags pretend not to know the countrymen who are bowing before them. They pass on. Stop, good sirs. A word with thee. The wags stop. Dost thou not know us? I have not that pleasure. Thou didst talk with us but yester-eve. Some mistake, I fear, my good man. The wags start off, weeping. Wait, I pray thee, wait. The wags stop. Canst thou not tell us who we are? Do you not know yourselves? Alas, we are not ourselves. Thou wouldst know us, were we as we were once. Perhaps those flags will solve the riddle. True enough, let us look at them. The countrymen remove flags and hand them to wags, who look at them intently. Mysteriously. Can it be? It is, it is. Eh? Eh? Two countrymen. Your pardon, I do crave your pardon. Taking a ring from his finger, turning to second countrymen. Please to accept this ring. I shall then know I am forgiven for not recognizing you at first. Accepting ring, putting it on the first finger of his right hand. Why, yes, I forgive thee. To first countryman, taking off his gold chain. Please to accept this chain. By that I shall know I too am forgiven. Accepting chain, putting it on. Thou art forgiven? Now tell me what great person I have become. Jest with us no more. We go now to announce your arrival to the Lord Mayor. Presently we will return. Await us here. They go, laughing aside. Dost thou know? 
I have always felt that I was really a great person. Hast thou not always noticed something unusual about me? I cannot say that I have. There is, however, certainly something wonderful about me. I have noticed it for a long time. Hast thou not felt it when in my company? I have not. Thou hast not? Never, thou silly goose. The second countryman snatches the first countryman's chain and throws it over the wall. Mind how thou callest me names, thou booby. Tearing off second countryman's ring and throwing it over the wall. Silly goose. I will now depart for my home. I do not desire thy company. I likewise will return, and likewise I wish to journey alone. They take up their blankets and discover the gourds. Eh? Eh? Let us tie them around our ankles. We may then discover whether we are ourselves. They tie the gourds round their ankles. I am myself. And I am myself. Come, let us journey back together. They go out. Pause. Enter the wags. They remain at entrance, not knowing countrymen have gone. Whispering. Do you think the musicians should follow them? Whispering. No, they should follow the music. What a joke it is. They look around and discover that the countrymen have gone. My ring. My chain. End of The Two Countrymen Play 14, Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. The Man, read by Lydia. The Alligator, read by Todd. The Wolf, read by Margaret S. Bayat. The Leopard, read by Tricia G. The Rabbit, read by... Shakira Sill. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Man and the Alligator. The Man and the Alligator. Scene 1. Time. The morning after the cyclone. Place. The man's garden. The man enters the garden, carrying his big stick and small net. The garden has been almost destroyed by the alligator, who still wallows among the beds. There should be enough apples on the ground to fill my net. "'Twas a fierce storm last night. He looks about, sees the alligator, shows indignation. "'Thou, within my garden! "'Be not angry with me, old master. "'My accident, I—' "'Accident? "'Thou hast wallowed among my flowers by accident, hast thou?' "'It is true. "'Not of my own will came I hither.' Thou hast broken my fruit trees by accident, I suppose. Nodding. It was not of my own intentions, I assure you. I... Interrupting. Thou art this moment crushing my strawberry plants beneath thy great body. I've a mind to beat thee with my big stick. Do not beat me, O master. The cyclone is at fault. The cyclone? Nodding. Aye, it blew me here from the river last night. Ha, ha, a likely story. I speak the truth. A great waterspout lifted me out of the river. Then a fierce wind caught me and blew me about as if I were a feather. Finally, I was dropped here within thy garden. Only half convinced. Well, there's no cyclone to blow thee back. Wilt thou be good enough to walk thyself out? Alas, I can scarcely move me. I fear some of my ribs are broken. Nonsense! Out with thee! 
But see how the wind has crippled me. It has even blown some of my claws loose. Interrupting. I am sorry for thee, but thou canst not remain here. I will go now, if thou wilt help me. I help thee? Nodding. I will be so grateful to thee. Oh, I know how grateful thou canst be. The other animals have told me that. What say they? That thou art the most cruel of, of all the animals, that thou never dost any one a favour. Interrupting. Nonsense! No one could be more grateful for favours than I. I'll prove it to thee. Prove it how? If thou wilt help me to the river, I'll show thee where to find the biggest fish. Well, that's something. And when thou wouldst cross the river, I'll carry thee. Of a surety, that's good of thee. Perhaps, after all, thou art not so black as thou art painted. I'll help thee this time. Thanks to thee, master. I will never forget thy kindness. I will always be thy friend. Why, I am glad to help thee. Now how am I to get thee to the river? Carry me, please, all master. What? Carry thee. Nodding. I'll get into thy net. Thou get into my small net. Only hold thy net open. Holding his net open. I tell thee, thou canst never get in. See how I fold my arms? My legs go under, so. Now I roll myself up, and up, and up, and now I am in, all in. Well, seeing is believing. Please to tie up thy net, master, that I may not fall out. Tying net. Tis done. Throwing net over shoulder. Thou art heavy. I know it will be hard work for thee, but some day thou wilt see how grateful I am. The man goes, carrying the alligator over his shoulder and his big stick in his hand. Scene 2. Time, the afternoon of the same day. Place, the river bank. Enter the man, carrying the alligator over his shoulder. He stops, throws down his big stick, and places the alligator carefully on the bank. Our journey is ended, brother. Untying net. Now then, roll thyself out. The alligator comes out of the net. Well, how dost thou feel now? Much better, thanks to thee. But I am very hungry, and I find I'm still quite weak. I pray thee help me down the bank, O oh master. Helping the alligator down the bank. Now then, thou art close to the water. He turns to go. Just a little farther, please. I am still so weak. Then I'll help thee into the water. He helps the alligator into the water. Now thou art in, and now I will depart. He turns to go. Seizing the man's leg. Not yet. Let go of my leg. Why? 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 Nodding. Why and wherefore? Thou art hurting me. It will soon be over. What dost thou mean? What I have just spoken. Why dost thou look at me so? Slowly. Because I mean to eat thee. Eat me? Nodding. Eat thee. Me? Nodding. Thee. 
thou didst promise to be my friend. I was only fooling thee. But I helped thee out of trouble. No matter. I mean to eat thee. Is that the way to repay a favour? By doing a wrong? Nodding. That's the way of all the animals. Thou art surely mistaken. Not all the animals. Interrupting. There's not one of them remembers a favour or a friend when hungry. I cannot think that. Suppose we ask the first animal that comes to drink. Ask any of them. I know what they will say. Enter the wolf. He comes down to the bank to drink. Wolf, I would question thee. Well. How dost thou repay the one who doth thee a favour? By doing him a wrong. The wolf drinks and goes. Ha, ha, ha! Just what I said. Now I shall eat thee forthwith. I can't believe that every animal would answer so. I don't intend waiting for thee to find out. I pray thee wait till the next animal comes to drink. Impatiently. Have I not told thee of my hunger? Listen, some animal comes through the forest now. Enter the leopard. He comes down to drink. Leopard, I would question thee. Well? How dost thou repay the one who doth thee a favour? By doing him a wrong. He drinks and goes. Ha, ha, ha! It is just as I said. I will now eat thee forthwith. I pray thee. Interrupting. It is now all over with thee. Calling. Help! Help! Enter the rabbit. A word with thee, Ally dear. I shall be busy for a few minutes, brother rabbit. Going down bank quickly. Who is this thou art about to dine upon? Why, tis the man. How dost thou repay a favour, brother rabbit? Why dost thou ask? I found the alligator in my garden this morning. He had destroyed my plants, my fruits, and... Interrupting. I was blown in by the cyclone last night. He said he had been hurt, and begged me to help him to the river. He promised me his friendship if I would do so. Ha, ha, ha! I told him I'd show him where to find the biggest fish. And now thou wilt not? But I will. He'll find it after he is inside of me. Ha, ha! Ha, ha! A good joke! I told him I'd carry him across the river. I didn't explain he'd go inside. Ha, ha! What a joker thou art, Ally dear. He turns to the man. But how didst thou get him here? I carried him in this small net. Looking surprised. Thou art trying to fool me. No, Brother Rabbit, it is quite true. Nodding. Yes, it is true. But, Ally, try as thou mightst, thou couldst not so much as get thy head into that net. But I tell thee, I did. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> I do not like thy manners, young man. But it's such a joke. <laughs> Cease thy laughing, or I shall eat thee some day. I laugh because I must laugh. <laughs> Thou wilt not believe it, eh? Well, not unless I see it. We can prove it to thee, brother rabbit. Oh, that's good, too. <laughs> Dost thou think we cannot? O 
Of course thou canst not. If thou couldst, thou wouldst. And we will. Get thy net ready, man. But how? Thou art holding my leg. Freeing the man, turning to the rabbit. We'll show thee just how it was done, young man. Seeing is believing. The man brings his net, opens it. See? I put my legs under, so. Then I fold my arms, so. Now I roll myself up, and up, and up. And now I'm all in, all in. As I live, thou art. Well, seeing is believing. But how couldst thou remain within the net? It is quite open. Tie it up, man. Show him exactly how we did it. Tying net. I tied it tight, like this, Brother Rabbit. Is it quite tight? Let him try the knot, man. Trying knot. Most truly it is tight. Turning to the alligator. Thou dost look as if thou couldst not move, Ally dear. Of a surety, I cannot. Well, brother man, now that thou hast him, don't be foolish enough to let him go. Get thy big stick and beat him to death. Eh? Not heeding the alligator. That is just what I will do, that I will. Thanks to thee for helping me, Brother Rabbit. Have pity! Not heeding the alligator. No thanks are necessary, Brother Man. I haven't forgotten the good turnips thou didst give me last winter when the ground was covered with snow. Some of us know how to return favor for favor. End of The Man and the Alligator Play 15 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckel The Dame Read by Margaret Espyat. Isabel, her daughter. Read by Tricia G. Flatfoot. Read by Maria Therese. Hanging Lip. Read by K. Hand. Broadthumb. Recording by K. Cotter. The Queen. Read by Shakira Searle. The Prince. Read by Lydia. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson The Song in the Heart Scene 1 Time, Once Upon a Time Place, In the House of the Poor Spinner The living room in the dame's cottage is seen. The dame and the three great-aunts are spinning. Isabel sits at her spinning wheel, but has stopped work and looks out of the open door. Isabel, you gaze without. Nodding upon those great trees mother how beautiful they are how like sentinels they stand at our door guarding us growling what nonsense you'd better be spinning not heeding mother see you that old oak see how proudly it lifts its head up into the sky tis the king of the forest growling I never heard such foolish talk. Not heeding. Mother, a song has come to me. Tis a song to the beautiful trees. Let me stop to write it down while my heart is full of it. To the dame. Do you not permit it, sister. She should be working. She can scarcely spin at all. Showing much feeling. Isabel, Isabel, not a maid in the village thinks of anything but spinning. Mother, let me stop. Soon the song will leave me. I may ne'er hear it again. To the dame. Sister, she will bring you to shame. Already the village folk laugh at her. 
nodding. Aye, they call her the dreamer. I myself have heard them. I care not what they call me. Raising her voice. Nay, but I care. I'll not have you different from other folk. We were never seen gazing upon trees. Nodding. Aye, we never heard songs within us. Nodding. Aye, we think only of our work. What's your work may not be mine. Decidedly. There's no other work for a maid than spinning. Sighing. I like it not. Though every other maid in all the world did love to spin, I'd say the same. I like it not. To Flatfoot, showing alarm. Sister, close the door, that none without may hear such words. Flatfoot rises, but it is too late. The queen enters from the street, showing displeasure. How now? What's all this noise? I heard it from the street. All are frightened. Isabel weeps. Bowing. Twill not happen again, your majesty. Looking at Isabel. Have they beaten you, my child? Still sobbing. N no, your majesty. To the dame. Tell me why your daughter weeps. More frightened. She weeps because, because... She stops in confusion. Well, well... Because, because, I will not let her spin. Showing surprise. Because you will not let her spin? Nodding. Yes, Your Majesty. Why? This is most strange. Nodding. Would I but let her, she'd spin from morn till night, and from then on till morn again. I see how it can be so. There's nothing I like better than spinning. She weeps whenever I make her leave off. Tis because she loves it. I am never more pleased than when the wheels are whirring. But stop she must, for today at least there is no more flax. I have rooms full of flax. Let your daughter come to my castle. She may spin there as much as she pleases. Now most frightened. I, I fear she would be a trouble to you. Why no? In fact, I am so pleased with your daughter's industry. I will have my son marry her. So frightened she can scarcely breathe. Oh, your majesty. Interrupting. But first, she must spin all my flax. There are three rooms full of it, from top to bottom. Showing alarm. Three rooms full? Nodding. Aye, my dear, and when you have spun it all, you shall become a princess. Turning to the dame. Bring your daughter to my castle tomorrow. Bowing. Yes, your majesty. Going. Tomorrow, mind you. Bowing. Yes, your majesty. All bow to the queen, who goes. Mother, how could you tell the queen I love to spin? Think you I'd let the truth be known? I'd not shame myself so. I could not spin three rooms of flax in three hundred years. Alas, alas, what shall we do? To hanging lip and broad thumb. Sisters, let us speak together. The three great aunts whisper together for a moment. 
Isabel, we will help you. Interrupting. On one condition. Nodding. I, on a certain condition. What do you mean? We'll spin the flax for you. Interrupting. On one condition. Nodding. I, on a certain condition. You speak in riddles, sisters. Tis this. If Isabel will invite us to her wedding, we'll spin the flax. That's the condition. Nodding. Ay, that's the certain condition. Twill be deceiving the queen and the prince both. There's no other way to mend things. Go now. Since you are so soon to be a princess, I'll give you leave to write down your song. Nodding. The song is no longer in my heart. Tis well. Now listen. You must never let the prince know about your songs. He'd send you from the castle. Nodding. Besides, it would bring great shame upon us, for we are a family of spinners. Nodding. Aye, aye. Nodding. Aye, aye. Scene two. Time, one week later. Place, the Queen's Castle. The three great aunts are working in the last heap of flax in the third room. Isabel watches them anxiously. Think you to finish before the Queen comes? Nodding as she treads the wheel. Ay, uh, if treading the wheel will do it. Nodding as she moistens the thread over her lip. Ay, if moistening the thread will do it. Nodding as she presses the thread with her thumb. Aye, if pressing the thread will do it. Tis today she brings the prince. Another minute and we'll have finished. Should they come suddenly, you know where to hide, behind those curtains there. Nodding. Aye, we know. A noise is heard in the distance. Someone comes. She runs to the door, opens it, and looks out. The prince comes down the stairs. Quick, aunts, quick. Rising. Well, tis finished. Looking into hall. Now comes the queen. To the curtains, quick. The three great aunts hide behind the curtains just as the queen and the prince enter. Well, have you finished? Pointing to a pile of thread. There's the last of it, your majesty. Looking at thread. Spun in the finest style, too. Prince, but a week ago these rooms were filled with flax. Now look at them. Looking about. Empty, as if, as if flax had never been here. "'Tis wonderful how one maid could do so much. "'Tis most wonderful. "'The wedding shall take place today. "'Isabel, come now with us. "'Thoughtfully. "'No, no, I cannot. "'You cannot? "'You cannot? "'What do you mean?' "'To the Queen.' Let me go home, your majesty. Go home? I am not worthy. Interrupting. Nonsense. That you are poor is nothing to me. Going. Come. The wedding bells shall ring at once. Your majesty, I... I... I did not spin the flax. What? You did not spin the flax? What is this? I deceived you. I can scarcely spin at all. But this pile of thread here. Twas spun by another. 
Another? Yes, Prince. You shall marry that one, then, my son. To Isabel. As for you, return to your hovel. Isabel turns to go. Stay. Isabel stops. Who is the wonderful spinner? Tell us where to find her. Here, your majesty. Hidden away, I suppose. Nodding. Yes, your highness, behind those curtains. Go, my son, and draw the curtains. You shall be the first to look upon your bride. The prince draws the curtains and sees the three great aunts who sit in a row. They smile and smile upon the prince who stands looking at them in astonishment. You'd never be sorry to take me for your bride, my lord. Not heeding. Why is your foot so flat? From treading the wheel, from treading the wheel. You'd never be sorry to take me for your bride, my lord. Not heeding. Why is your lip so long? From moistening the thread, from moistening the thread. You'd never be sorry to take me for your bride, my lord. Not heeding. Why is your thumb so broad? From pressing the thread, from pressing the thread. The prince turns to Isabel. Quickly. Isabel does not but gaze and gaze on flowers and trees and running brooks. Ha ha ha. Is this true, Isabel? Yes, Prince. She says these flowers and trees and running brooks do sing her songs. Ha, ha, ha. Is this true, Isabel? Yes, Prince. And she begs leave to write down these songs. <laughs> Is this true, Isabel? Hanging head. Yes, Prince. Isabel, hang not your head. I'll give you time to write your songs. My son! Interrupting. Nay, nay, mother. The songs please me better than the flat foot and the hanging lip and the broad thumb of the spinners. Come, Isabel, you shall be my princess. You shall sing me your songs. You shall teach me how to gaze upon flowers and trees and running brooks. For these things have ever been dear to my heart. Come, Isabel, come. End of The Song in the Heart Play 16 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle The Emperor, read by Todd The General, read by Hugh Gillis First Aid, read by Lydia. Second Aid, read by Maria Therese. The Mayor's Wife, read by Amanda Friday. Mayor's Son, read by Jesse Yoon. The Rich Merchant's Wife, read by Savannah Alday. The Rich Merchant's Son, read by Shakira Searle. The Poor Woodcutter's Wife, read by Margaret Espyot. Poor Woodcutter's Son, read by Lydia. Ludwig, read by Roslyn Carlyle. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. The Emperor's Test. The Emperor's Test. Scene 1. Time, 1 spring, noon. Place, an army camp on the banks of a large creek. A village is nearby. To the south is a great forest. An anteroom in the Emperor's tent is seen. Great curtains separate this room from the Emperor's room back. An aide waits in the anteroom. Enter the general from the Emperor's room. To the aide. Have any yet come from the village? The Emperor would know. Yes, general. They wait without. Bid them enter. 
crossing, speaking to those without. You will please enter. Enter the mayor's wife and son, the rich merchant's wife and son. Have you come to see the emperor? General, we have. His Majesty wishes you to leave your sons here in camp until evening. General, could you not tell us the Emperor's plans? Yes, Madame. The Emperor must march southward where the enemy is in camp. He wishes a guide who can lead him safely through this great forest. We were told the Emperor would greatly honor the lad he chooses. Tis true, Madame. The lad chosen will be made an aide. I thought only princes were chosen for the Emperor's aides. They have always been princes. This is a great opportunity for the lads of this village. But how will the Emperor make a choice? A test will be given every boy who comes. This test will prove his fitness to be guide. Enter an aide from the Emperor's room. General, the Emperor would see you. The General bows to the ladies and leaves. Turning to the ladies. The Emperor will receive you presently. Aid goes. Enter the poor woodcutter's wife and son. I heard the Emperor wanted a guide. The Emperor only wants the boys of the best families, madam. Enter the Emperor, General, and Captain. They remain back, are not seen by the ladies. Sighing. Oh, I suppose that is true, but Pierre is a smart boy. If the Emperor could only see him. Interrupting. The Emperor wants a boy with proud manners, as such as all boys have. Fiddlesticks! Bowing. Your Highness! Fiddlesticks and candles, I say. I am sorry, Your Majesty. I didn't know how it was. Come, Pierre. She turns to go. Remain. Pierre shall have the test with the others. Ladies, you shall know whom I have chosen when the test is finished. I bid you good day. The ladies bow and go turning to the boys. My lads, go through the forest southward till you come to the river. You may then return. Captain, see that guards go with them. My lads, you must not speak the one to the other until I have again seen you. I must have your word on that. Do you promise? Sire, we, we promise. promise. Tis well. Captain, they are now in your charge. General, a word with you. The Emperor and General go into Emperor's room. The Captain leads the boys from the tent. Scene 2. Time, two hours later. Place, the Emperor's tent, the Emperor's room. The Emperor is seen sitting at a table looking at maps. Enter an aide. He salutes. Well? The prisoner has returned, sire. What prisoner? The one sent out for the test, sire. Who was sent? Ludwig, the prisoner who has been ill for so long. Ah, yes. Bid him enter. Aid goes. He re-enters with Ludwig, who wears an old torn army cloak over his uniform. He salutes. I notice you are a bit lame, Ludwig. Yes, sire. In my left leg, my dog was hit at the same time. Does your dog go to battle with you? If he can slip into the ranks, sire, he always goes where I go, sire. Then he went with you today, of course. Yes, sire. You are sure the boys didn't see you? No one saw me. I kept a sharp lookout when I came to a clear space. I went to one side, hiding behind trees to look ahead. Then I ran across. That must have tired you, Ludwig. You're not quite well yet. I found I couldn't leap the streams. I had to climb down the banks and wade them. 
You rested by the way, didn't you? Yes, sire, and once I stopped to pick berries. You made the return trip by boat up the creek? Yes, sire. That is all. The aide and Ludwig go. The emperor claps his hands. Enter second aide. He salutes. To aide. Have the lads returned? No, sire. Do you know when the captain expects them? In about half an hour, sire. Bid their mothers return at that time. I wish them to be present at the test. Yes, sire. He salutes and goes. Let me see. A lame man. A lame dog. Running footprints across open spaces. Wading streams instead of leaping them. Stopping to pick berries. Why, the story reads itself. He sits at table, takes up maps. Well, we shall see what we shall see. Scene 3. Time, a half hour later. Place, the emperor's tent, the anteroom. The ladies wait in the lower end of the anteroom. Back is a great armchair. I cannot think why the boys were sent into the forest. Nor I. It seems to me that Bo should have asked them what they could do. Now, my boy dances so prettily. I was certain he would ask them to ride. Now my boy rides so well, just like a prince. Well, you are no doubt ask them all these things upon their return. She turns to Pierre's mother. You see, madam, how little chance your boy has. I am sure he cannot dance. No, madam. I am certain he does not ride. Sighing. <sighs> no, madam. Enter an aide, crosses to Emperor's room, announces at curtains. The boys have returned, sire. Enter the captain with the boys. Enter the general from Emperor's room. Announcing. The Emperor. Enter the Emperor. All bow. Sitting in armchair. I will now give the test. Captain, bring up the first boy. The captain brings up the rich merchant's son. Well, my lad, what did you see in the forest? Many, many trees, sire. You saw nothing but trees? That was all, sire. Just trees. I shall not want you. You may go. Oh, your majesty, if you could only see him dance. Candles and cheese. Do I want a dancing guide? Captain, bring up the next one. The captain brings up the mayor's son. Well, my lad, what did you see in the forest? I saw trees and bushes, sire. Nothing more? No, sire. I shall not want you. You may go. Oh, your majesty, if you could only see him ride, just like a prince, sire. Fiddlesticks. Captain, the last boy there. The captain brings up Pierre. Well, my lad, what did you see in the forest? I saw that a man had passed southward just before us, sire. How did you know that? Did you see him? No, sire, I saw his footprints. He was lame in the left leg. How did you learn that? The footprints were deeper on the right side. His dog was lame also. He had a dog? Yes, sire, a lame dog, I'm sure, because one of his tracks was always faint or missing. Did you trace this man and dog by their footprints? Yes, sire, to the river. There were traces of them in the grass, in the mud, in the dust, on rocks, and in still water. I am certain they had passed but a short time before, not more than half an hour. How could you tell that? The grass had not yet straightened up. The tracks in the mud had not yet filled with water. The prints in the dust were still clear, although a wind was blowing. 
Good. But how did you know they had but just passed through still water and over rocks? The water had not yet settled, and the rocks were still damp. Good. Very good. Sire, I fear this man is one of the enemy. Indeed. What proof have you of that? This, sire. Handing a small piece of cloth to Emperor. T to the color of the enemy's uniform. It is, my lad. How came you by it? I found it on a thorn bush. It was torn from his cloak, sire. And why from his cloak? The thorn bush was at least three feet from the man's line of travel. The wind blew the cloak about. Handing the cloth to an aide, whispering to him. Take this to Ludwig. The aide goes. Well, Pierre, do you think we should be in fear of this enemy? I do not know, sire. I only know that he has a good disposition. He turns to Pierre's mother. A good disposition? How do you know that? The dog was always near him. When the man stopped to rest, the dog lay down at his feet. But he may have held the dog there, my lad. Not while he was picking berries, sire. So our enemy picked berries, did he? Yes, sire, the dog lying by the bushes all the while. Do you think we could capture this man? Yes, sire, for he was very tired. How do you know that? He climbed down the banks of every small stream. I should have leaped them. You think it would be an easy matter, then, to follow and capture him? Not easy, sire, for he was always on the lookout. How do you know that? Whenever he reached a clear space, he went to one side, hiding behind trees to look ahead. Then he ran across the open. Your proof of this, my lad? His footprints in every clear space showed only the balls of the feet. Good. You followed him only to the river? Those were the orders, sire. Had I gone on, I had could have overtaken him by evening. That you could not, my lad, for the man is here now in camp. He returned by boat. Ladies, the test is over. Madam, your son shall be my guide. I am proud to have a boy of such keen sight and quick thought in my kingdom. And tis much to be the mother of such a lad. I salute you, madam. With greatest respect, I salute you. He bows to the happy woman with great courtesy. Turning to the ladies. Ladies, I bid you farewell. End of The Emperor's Test Play 17 of Children's Classics in Dramatic Form. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Roke. Read by Jesse Yoon. Carlos. Read by Hugh Gillis. Pancho. Read by Lydia. Schoolmaster. Read by Todd. Christopher Columbus, read by Tricia G. Porter, read by Jesse Yu. The Jester, read by Margaret Espayat. First Courtier, read by Lydia. Second Courtier, read by Maria Therese. Third Courtier, read by Kay Hand. King John, read by Rosalyn Carlyle. Rivera, the Sea Captain. Read by Jesse Yu. King Ferdinand. Read by Shakira Searle. A Monk. Read by Todd. Queen Isabella. Read by Amanda Friday. First Wise Man. Read by Lydia. Second Wise Man. Read by Maria Therese. Third Wise Man. Read by Kay Hand. Messenger. Read by Hugh Gillis. First Sailor, read by Lydia. Second Sailor, read by Maria Therese. 
Third Sailor, read by K. Hand. Fourth Sailor, read by Hugh Gillis. Captain Pinzon, read by Marianne. Children's Classics in Dramatic Form by Augusta Stevenson. Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus. Scene 1. Time, 1 morning, 1484. Place, a street in front of King John's Palace, Lisbon, Portugal. Gates to courtyard of palace in background. Enter Carlos, Roque, and Pancho. They carry their school books. A noise is heard in the courtyard. Stopping, listening. They're stirring in the king's courtyard. He runs to closed gates, peeps through a crack. Come, Roque, we shall be late to school. Throwing down books. Come, look, they're laying the red carpets in the court. Throwing down books, peeping. To for the king they lay them. Come, the master will be angry. But the king will soon be coming. Let's wait and see him, Carlos. Not I. I know how the master flogs. Yesterday I came late to school. Why were you late? I stopped to watch the crazy Italian Columbus. He starts off, the others follow. I saw him once. I wish I might see him. There he comes now. Calling. Loco! Aye, there he is! Calling. Loco! Loco! Calling. Loco, loco! Enter Columbus, dignified and gentle. A crowd of boys follow. Loco! 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 Enter schoolmaster, carrying a switch. Flourishing switch. To school with you! To school now! Boys run off in alarm, turning angrily upon Columbus. You were teaching them your foolish notions, sir! Smiling. I'd like the chance to do so, master. Ah, then you have been at it! I saw them all about you! I taught them nothing, master, this time. Tis well for you, sir, that you did not. The world is flat, sir, flat! Do you not know that, sir? I was so taught. How do you dare, then, to say the world is round? Much study and common sense, dear master, have made me dare. The lessons taught your fathers are good enough for you, sir. That cannot be, dear master. How, then, could the world move on? Move on? Hear him talk. Do you think, sir, that an elephant carries his flat world on his back and walks about with it? Ha! Ha! Gates are opened. Porter is seen. Going. Go tell the king this world is round. Ha! Ha! Go tell the king! Schoolmaster goes. Seeing Columbus, aside. Ah, tis the crazy Italian. Porter, I seek the king. Do you think he'll listen to your silly talk? Oh, I have of you. Away. Come, let me in. Away, away with you, loco. Enter from gates the jester in cap and bells, hostlers and servants. Who's away? Who's crazy? The Italian there. He who says this world is round. Round? How now? Round, say you. Nodding, laughing. <laughs> With people on the other side. Or standing on their heads, so? Jester stands on his head. All laugh. Enter a courtier. The king comes. Enter King John and many courtiers. Capering about Columbus. Heh 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 heh. What's this, jester? 
Here's he, sire, who says this world is round. He capers about Columbus, all laugh. I've heard of your notions, Columbus. So you think there's land to be discovered, do you? Yes, your majesty, I'm sure of it. With people a-standin' on their heads, so. He stands on his head, all laugh. Silence! Columbus, I've a mind to listen and give you ships and money. Have you maps and charts to prove your plans? Taking maps from cloak. Yes, sire. Wait, then, till I have spoken with my courtiers. Columbus bows and retires and unrolls maps. Captain Rivera crosses to Columbus, talks with him aside. Speaking softly to courtiers. You know, my courtiers, that should there be new lands, great glory will be given the discoverer of them. Aye, sir, it will bring him great honour. And riches. Tis I and I alone who should have the honour and the riches. Aye, sir. Aye, sire. But nothing can be done without the Italian's maps and charts. No one but he knows the route over the unknown seas. Well, we must have his maps and charts. He'll not sell them, sire. You may depend on that. And we'll not buy them. Go, bid my fool take them. Courtiers showing surprise. Go, I say, and see to it. Courtiers talk aside with Jester. To Columbus. I wish you well, sir, for I believe that what you say is true. I'm glad to hear you say that, Captain. My ship is in the harbor now, and I must go. But I wish you well, Columbus. I wish you well. Columbus, throwing his maps on the stone bench near the gates, takes Rivera's hands in his. The jester creeps up, takes maps, runs into court with them, and disappears. With feeling. I thank you, Captain. So few believe in me. Come now, within Columbus. I'll look at your maps and charts. Rivera goes turning to take up maps. Why, how is this? My maps were here but just a moment ago. Who saw his maps? Pause. The courtiers are silent, sir. I laid them there, sire. Then there they should be. Someone has taken them. Tis a joke. Interrupting. My courtiers do not play jokes in my presence. Those maps and charts are precious to me, sire. Come now, I'm not so sure you ever had maps or charts. Your Majesty! Well, produce them. But, sire... Interrupting. I'll not hear excuses. Your maps, sir, at once, sir. I'll make other maps and charts. Away with you. Your Majesty. Away, I say, and come to us no more with tales of unknown lands. Enter Jester from Gates. With people a-walkin' on their heads, so. Jester stands on his head, all laugh. Columbus goes, showing bitter disappointment. Scene 2. Time, 1492. Place, Spain. Court of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Many courtiers and ladies are seen in audience room of palace. A throne is in the background. Enter the first courtier. The King and Queen. Enter King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, followed by courtiers, ladies, and the wise men. All bow as King and Queen cross to throne and sit. Enter the monk. He advances to throne and bows. Speak, good father. I pray your majesties to see one Christopher Columbus. Columbus? The Italian who thinks he can find a short route to the Indies, sire. Nodding. Ah, I remember. 
You brought his plans to us some time ago, good father. Nodding. Let us see him today, sire. To first courtier. Admit this Christopher Columbus. Courtier admits Columbus. He kneels before the king. Rise, Columbus, and tell us what you seek. Rising. Ships, sire, to prove the plans which I did send to your majesties, plans for sailing in the unknown seas. They seem to me most wise and sensible. Ah, your majesty believes with me? Hastily. I'd have our wise men speak. Unfold your maps before them, sir. Columbus crosses to wise men and unfolds a map before them. They look at it, shake their heads, and laugh. With dignity. I propose to sail by this route to find that eastern land. Ha ha! I never heard anything so absurd. He'd sail west to find the east. Ha ha! <laughs> Pointing to map. The edge of the world is out there in those strange waters, and you are willing to fall off with your ships into space, sir. I'm sure the water continues. Interrupting. How could there be land beyond? T'would be under us, and the trees would have to grow their roots in the air. Wise men nod wisely. And the rain must needs fall upward there. Nodding wisely. Aye, aye, aye. I've heard you did lay your plans before King John of Portugal. I did, Your Majesty. That was bad for you, Columbus. King John sent ships, but they soon returned. Turning to Captain Rivera. Was not that the way of it, Captain? You sailed with them, I believe. Yes, sire. But the fairy came because the sailors were afraid and refused to go on. To Columbus. You were thus avenged for the Thib River map, sir. Would you sail again with this man as your leader, Captain? I would, Your Majesty. I believe not in the monsters and the edge. Nor I. Let's provide the ship, sire. Our people would not like it. They'd grumble. And so t'would be bad for us. Enter messenger in great haste, kneels before king and queen. What news do you bring? Speak. The Turks have captured the Spanish merchant ships. Our ships bound for the Indies. Yes, your majesty. Alas, alas. The merchants and the sailors, did the Turks spare them? Not one, your majesty. Alas, such loss of life, and tis not the first time, not a month that does not bring us the same sad news. To Monk. You must give our people consolation, father. Tis not so much consolation they need, as another passage to the Indies, one far away from Turkey and the cruel Turks. You are right, father. Speak on. To find such a passage is the chief purpose of Christopher Columbus. That is the hope that has given him courage when half the world called him fool. Sire, we must find ships and money. We dare not tax the people more. Then I'll help you, Columbus. I'll pledge my own jewels to raise the funds. Your Majesty! Tis for the safety of our merchants. "'Tis for the glory of Spain!' Kneeling before Queen, kissing her robe. "'My Queen!' Scene 3. Time, five months later, evening. Place, on board the Santa Maria. The sailors are seen sitting on deck in a group. They are gloomy and dejected. "'Tis a sea of darkness!' "'Last night I heard the angry sea-gods.' Nodding. Aye, I heard them. What were they crying? Angry words to us for coming into their own waters. Tis the Italian Columbus the sea gods should destroy. 
Aye, aye. aye. We'll never see Spain again. We should compel him to return. Aye, aye. 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 Enter Columbus with Captain Pinton. They cross to the bow of the ship. The captain glances uneasily at the sailors. Admiral, I must tell you frankly, the sailors are dissatisfied. I am sorry to hear that, Captain. What shall we do, sir? Do? Why, sail on. I'll see to it, sir. Captain goes. Crossing. Admiral, the men have chosen me to speak for them. What do they wish? To return to Spain, sir. Tell them we may see land any day now. Shaking head. They'll no longer listen to that. Then tell them that I mean to sail on. Starting. Sail on? Yes, to sail on and on. Go tell them that. Sailor goes. Enter Captain. Admiral, the sailors below show signs of mutiny. Mutiny? Nodding. The same as these on deck. Only look at them. The sailors talk together excitedly and gesticulate wildly. Ah, uh, if I could only give them my courage. I fear for your life, Admiral, if the order is not given to return. I cannot give it, Captain. The sailors on deck are joined by others from below. They rush down upon Columbus. You must take us back to Spain, sir. We'll not go farther, sir. Aye. 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 I'm sure we will soon find land. Interrupting. Hear, hear him, him. Hear, hear, him. hear him. To the one who first sees land, the queen has promised money. Interrupting. Money to feed to the sea monster? Threateningly. Will you turn back? With determination. No. Now, men, back to your duties. Alas, we'll never see our homes again. Nor our friends. We are lost men. What shall we do? What, what shall, shall we, we do? do? What shall, what we, shall, do? shall we do? As their anger turns to despair, Columbus is touched. Listen, men, I make you this promise. If we do not see land within three days, we will return to Spain. There. Now. That's a fair promise. Go now to your duties. And let every man watch for land as he has never watched before. Pleased. Aye, 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 sir. aye sir. Sailors cross to a distant part of deck. Alas for my plans and my hopes, if these three days bring not land. He talks aside with Captain. We were too easily won over, men. Nodding. Fearful things may happen to us in three days. Suppose we reach the edge tomorrow. Suppose the sea monster should come for us tonight. Aye, aye. 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 Come closer, men. There's something I would say to you. Sailors close about him. Captain goes. Pointing to Columbus, who stands in bow, looking at the stars. Why should he not fall into the seas tonight? What? You mean? I mean he must fall into the seas tonight. Are you with me, men? Aye. 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 "'Tis my plan to push him over as he stands there looking at the stars. "'Why not creep upon him now?' "'Are you willing, men, to have the deed done now?' "'Yes, yes, yes, yes.', yes. 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 To second and third sailors. "'Come with me, you two. We'll creep up on his left.' They creep upon Columbus, who is seen to suddenly bend forward, looking eagerly into the distance. Land! Land! Sailors, stop. Enter the captain. Did you say land, sir? 
land captain land come sailors come land land looking land land, land. 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 lifting his arms now heaven be praised end of christopher columbus end of children's classics and dramatic form by augusta stevenson